All right, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. So hello everyone um, and welcome to this month's library tutorial, which is going to be about scoping reviews. My name is Steph Hundren. I'm the clinical information librarian here at Augusta University. Um, and so my goals for this session are I'm going to talk just a little bit about, you know, kind of the introductory information about what scoping reviews are, what do they do. We'll talk about the format and steps that you need to complete. Um, in order to produce one. And at the end, I'll talk about other resources and ways that you can get help either at the beginning of a project, in the middle of a project, anywhere in between, um, either from us or outside the library as well. All right, so scoping reviews are a type of publication that is a little bit less familiar. You know, normally people are familiar with narrative reviews, they know systematic reviews, um, and but scoping reviews, it's a little bit newer and it's a little bit different, even though it is very much tied to systematic reviews. And in fact, scoping reviews originally came about because they are kind of like the footwork for systematic review. Um, they go in and people might do this to gauge how much research is available on a topic and whether there's enough to warrant a systematic review. And based off of all that work, it's actually become a publication type in and of itself. Um, and because of this, its aims and scopes are generally more general um, and they can cover a wider variety of information um, and a much larger volume than a systematic review. A scoping review looks at general questions or research um, and it's kind of just mapping out what is currently available. So for instance, it can look at how much literature is out there, what types of concepts, ideas, arguments are being discussed in the literature, and what types of things um, on the flip side is not being discussed and where are the areas of opportunity. Um, and the definition that I've pulled here is from a, a typology of reviews. This is a very common article and I'll be talking more about this uh, paper a little bit later on in the presentation. Some other things that scoping reviews are good at are mapping key concepts, clarifying working definitions or boundaries of a given concept, um, and identifying the gaps and opportunities in the research, as I've previously mentioned. Um, and just because they're seen as a, kind of the footwork or the beginning stages of a systematic review doesn't mean that it necessarily takes less time than a systematic review. Scoping reviews can still take multiple months, even up to a year or a little bit longer, depending on the scope of your question, the availability of your team, how much literature comes back, so on and so forth. So it does still take a, um, a fair amount of time that you should be um, you know, considering or conscientious of at the beginning stages of your project. Next, I want to talk through kind of the general steps in order to complete a scoping review. The first step, like always, uh, is to develop a research question or a topic that you would like to learn more about. However, scoping reviews don't usually work with a PICO format um, because with the, kind of the nature of the scoping review, it, it doesn't really um, concern itself with the effectiveness or which piece is better. It just wants to know what is out there. So instead, it likes to use a more general format, um, and the common format is the PCC, your population, your concept, and the context in which you're looking at these two pieces. You will also need to think about whether you'd like to prepare a protocol at this stage as well. It's generally not required in a lot of the methodologies and the standards, but it is a good way to ensure that everyone is on the same page at the very beginning of the project, that you have um, already considered things like your inclusion and exclusion criteria, what are the steps, what is the timeline, so on and so forth. Um, in these protocols, the introduction will generally include some background information, such as your research question, the objectives, and the purpose. The purpose is something that kind of gets missed in a lot of scoping reviews, but it's even more important in a scoping review because of how forward-facing this type of publication is. It's meant to guide someone on what research should come next, or what are we doing in the future, or what opportunities lie ahead. So knowing what that purpose is and expressly and exclusively stating it is not only helping yourself, but it's also helping the people who are going to be reading your publication in the future to understand exactly how they can use the information that you found. Some ways to address the purpose is to explain why this body of literature needs to be summarized, what you can hope to accomplish by conducting the review, or how the results of the review will advance the state of knowledge on your given topic. 
And here's just a great example from a real scoping review that was published in 2012. So here you can see a research question that fits within the PCC format, the clear or one of the clear objectives that they had. There were multiple, so I just pulled one and the outline purpose for publishing the scoping review. And I'll talk a little bit more about where to find help or publish examples a little later on in this presentation. And here are some guidelines and uh, methodologies to use or to build off of if you are interested in using or publishing a protocol for your um, scoping review. I think that the biggest one that I've heard a lot and that I'm also the most familiar with is the one published by the Joanna Briggs Institute. They do currently have a 2017 version that's available. Um, if you just Google Joanna Briggs uh, scoping review methodology, I believe it'll pull up the PDF for the 2015 one. In addition to that, there are a couple other published methodologies, um, such as the two that are on here. And these two are available through our databases um, and our full text that we have available through the library. So your methodology is really going to be your kind of your be all end all rule book. It's going to state exactly what steps you need and how you're going to be going about those steps. The general steps are going to be pretty similar across all boards. It's just about kind of those specific details um, that might be tailored, for instance, for the Joanna Briggs and their publications or to other publication types or publication sites and journals as well. So back to our steps of the scoping review, we have our developing a research question, preparing the protocol. So then the next step would be selecting your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, and some of these pieces, you can be a little bit more general with it again, because you don't have it as specific as a research question. Um, and some inclusion and exclusion might create criteria might be helpful for the next step, which is going to be doing the cert string. Um, but some pieces like say the age of the population you would like to look at or the language of the published article would not be something that you want to include in your search string. Um, and if you have any questions about how to develop that, your librarian is more than happy to help work with you with the research question, developing inclusion and exclusion criteria, the literature search and beyond. From here, conducting the literature search is the next step. Generally speaking, a scoping review will search at least three databases um, in addition to looking at the gray literature as well. The gray literature is, can be really important for this review type specifically because again, they're, they're very forward thinking and so they're looking at what are the newest trends or what's on the horizon or what might be next. And that gray lit can give us a really good idea of that. From there, uh, the authors or researchers will go through the pool of articles. Um, and in this case, the scoping review is very similar to a systematic review because the screening will involve two rounds. One, um, taking a look just at the titles and the abstracts and a second screen to go through once you have kind of culled your number a little bit to take a look at the full text. And here's where um, a lot of different guidelines will say at least two authors need to go through and screen all articles. I would actually recommend three authors or three individuals to take a look at it because this way you have a tiebreaker in case there are conflicting votes about a specific article. Data extraction is typically next in a systematic review um, along with a update of the literature search if you need it. Again, this can take uh, multiple months to go through and to reach this point in the process. And many publications like to see a search that's been run within six months of the date of submission to a journal. So you might have to rerun your results to catch kind of the most recent stuff that has been published since you began your search. And then finally, you'll go on to synthesize and then publish the final paper. So now that we have this road mapped out for the process of a scoping review, uh, I'd like to go over what you will need to have or have assembled at square one at the very beginning of wanting to do a scoping review. First, you will need at least a team of two to three people. And you know, that's the bare minimum because of that screening the titles, abstracts and full text. 
um, and you might potentially have a couple other people for more specialized roles. This could be something like a librarian to create and execute the search, a research assistant to pull the full text of the articles and manage the different files for your project, uh, and so on. You'll of course need a topic plus a selected set of guidelines. Um, some ideas for inclusion and exclusion criteria are a plus at this point, but you can also save that for the first meeting where everyone gets together to start talking about the project. And then finally, you'll need time. I would say that scoping reviews don't always take as long as a systematic review, um, but as I mentioned before, they can. And at the very least, I would try to be generous with how much time you allot yourself and um, I would say give at least six to 10 months just to be safe. The largest time variables that you're going to be looking at for a scoping review are how often and how much time your team can get together and how much time they can devote to this specific project. Um, another big variable is the number of articles that come back and have to be screened as well. So you might be looking at maybe just a couple hundred for a smaller project, but you could also be getting up into the thousands, especially when you're including that gray literature as well. So um, this covers all of the information or kind of the general overview for scoping reviews. So I wanted to look at um, some more pieces about literature searching in general, because a scoping review, of course, is just one type of publication that you can do. So if you don't feel like your research question fits the scoping review, fits that PCC format, um, I would encourage you to take a look at this publication. This was this Booth publication that I had used for the definition of a scoping review back at the beginning of the presentation. And um, even though it was published in 2009, it is still very current and very helpful today. Librarians use it all the time. Um, and the benefit of this article, um, as you can see here, this is a screenshot of one of two main tables within this article where it's broken down the 14 different types of articles, a brief description about them, and some of the key characteristics um, that not only does the article have, but also kind of insinuates how much time or how much effort you would have to take in each of the different sections. Um, and this is just a great tool to help you decide exactly what type of publication might, you might be interested in or might best fit your research question and your needs. Additionally, there are also librarians on the campus. Um, we're more than happy to meet with you at any stage in your project, whether it's for a scoping review, systematic review, anything in between. Any specific question can be directed to your liaison librarian. Um, and this is the most recent table that I have pulled from our library's webpage. Although I should make a note uh, or note to everyone that Ansley Stewart, our Allied Health Sciences Librarian, is going to be leaving at the end of the week. So for those of you in the Allied Health Sciences College, I would recommend contacting um, either Peter Shipman or uh, Gail Kwame in the meantime. And if you have any questions about scoping reviews or you'd like to follow up with this presentation. There's my contact information on this slide, um, both my email and my phone number. And at this point, I can open the floor up to you all if you have any questions. All right, I don't see any questions coming through. So I will go ahead and end this presentation. But again, please feel free to get in touch with us if you have uh, any follow-up to this presentation or anything else. Thank you so much.